my question is, in the five years that you did your research and writing the book, was there something that surprised you, something that you started thinking one way and changed your train of thought while you were yeah, doing it? Because that's a million a... things. <laughs> um... Let me th I'm trying to think if there were any of them happy surprises. Um, well, the connection, finding the connection between Conner and Asperger blew my mind uh, because that was such a, I mean, it's still in hundreds of textbooks and Wikipedia probably, it still says that they were independent discoveries. So when I figured out that this guy, George Frankel, had diagnosed Conner's first autistic patients, that was like, holy moly, like, wow, I've actually solved one of the big mysteries of. 20th century medicine. So, so that, that was something. Um, Andrew Wakefield, he's the guy who you know, published the study that implicated vaccines. Um, when I started, I thought that maybe he was a true believer who had run a sloppy study, but that he thought he was so sincere that, you know, he, no. Um, I think he's a hoax, personally. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I ended up with a lesser opinion of him after I had looked at, you know, things like his te testimony to the European Parliament about the history of autism, in which o nearly everything he said was a lie or untrue. Um, so anyway. You're probably going to hate this question, but you, oh you, you have talked about having all of this stuff on the cutting room floor, especially about the modern era yeah. and the people you've talked to. And I've known you've gotten this question probably already, but do you have it in you to do another one, to do a book another that book? includes that? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. Rejoin the spanking machine, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, I could not, well, nobody ever has to do this book again, thank God. I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, uh, blogs maybe? I mean, there's a lot of material to, you know, all right. One thing that I have that should get out in the world in some form is I have these amazing interviews. And like I did the, the I believe the last in-depth interview with Lorna Wing. And uh, because she passed away just a couple years after I interviewed her. And by the way, I have to tell you that um, when I went to interview her outside of London in Bromley, her research assistant said, this young man has come all the way from America to talk to us. And I thought, my God, how could you write a book about autism without talking to Lorna? You know, there she is. It's like she knows. She was the founder of the parents' movement, for one, in, in England, which then inspired Bernie Rimland to found the parents' movement here. So, um, you know, she knew what was going on. So I have this long, long interview with her and Judith Gould, her, her assistant. I have tons of interesting interviews. Um, you know, like one of the things, one of the um, valid criticisms that I've gotten for the book is that there are not enough people of color in it. And uh, it's true, A. Eh? And th that was mostly because of that modern era problem. And I have, uh, I have a great interview with a, this fantastic musician named Mike Buckholz, who is a black guy on the spectrum. Um, I also have a fantastic interview with a evangelical Christian black woman who sees God's hand in neurodiversity. And she sort of got neurodiversity by reading a verse from the Bible. Um, and that's it. like, we normally think of neurodiversity as like this, some kind of white liberal thing or something, but no. You know, she had this really beautiful appreciation of neurodiversity from a Christian evangelical perspective. And so there are a lot of voices that I got that I would like to put out in the world somehow. I mean, I do have a blog on the Public Library of Science that's currently on hiatus. I'm going to be reawakening that blog at some point, and I certainly want to do that. I also have um, kind of fascinating stuff like uh, the Connor wrote a case history of a, an autistic woman who grew into adulthood. In a, and I, I don't know if I've ever seen a reference to it, but I, I, got, a, I got a hold of it. And um, it was very interesting, yeah. Thank you for taking the time to write the book, and it sounds like you really dedicated so much of your life for the last five years. Um, I do have a question about the diagnosis rates. Um, my son was diagnosed, uh, he's 24, and you know who knows what the thing, we were told it was one in 10,000. We were part of Bennett Leventhal and Kathy Lord's 
study. But um, of all the people we knew from college, high school, graduate schools, we went to different schools, all of our friends that we made living in San Francisco, um, we didn't know of a single person, and a lot of them had two to five kids. So, and all of our relatives and their friends, um, we didn't know of another person who had a child with autism, but we also didn't know of anyone that was diagnosed as schizophrenic or um, bipolar. So I'm confused. I still don't quite have, you know, a-, a I understand problem. what you're saying. Here's the thing. Let me play devil's advocate with myself and say, that vaccines cause autism in a certain subset of genetically susceptible children. I don't believe that, but I'll say it. If that's true, that's this happening on top of this, which my book uh, accounts for. And it's not just the diagnostic criteria broadening. It's not just the whole mindset of pediatricians and teachers um, going from passive reporting of isolated cases to active surveillance of all children for the warning signs of autism. Um, it's not just that families were told not to talk about their autistic children, not to talk about autism because it implicated them because they had a, a allegedly caused the autism. So they were told to, in fact, I heard this from several parents, to quietly remove the photographs of the children from the family albums and never speak of them again. So families with autism were rendered invisible. Um, basically, if someone is really serious about believing that there has been an increase in the modern era, then what they have to do is they have to subtract this, which is here. So the problem is that the, like the anti-vaccine people are not doing that. They're lying about my book and saying, you know, it whitewashes autism and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I really wish that somebody would say, thank you, because I'm actually quite serious about finding toxic environmental factors that cause autism. And you actually explained this, you know? And like what I'm hoping is that, you know, people down at the Mind Institute or whatever, you know, who, who are committed to finding environmental factors that cause autism, that this will help them actually clarify their research designs um, and also just clarify their thinking, you know. So I'm not, I would never claim that the process that I describe explains 100% of, you know, the, the, rise, the rise in estimated prevalence. I would never say that because I'm kind of a science guy, and you don't say things like, this is a closed case, you know? But I do know that what I write about explains really a lot. And the problem is that words like tsunami and epidemic, and they still get used really a lot. And so that's not what's happening, you know?